Okay, now what about memory? Now what about memory? It's been 30 years since the crucifixion, and then Mark writes this down. Okay, so the gospel writings, if in fact they're eyewitness testimony, they're recollective memory. Okay, and we know that unique events from contemporary research today, we know that unique events like the resurrection, for example, increase in accuracy as they are retold. Okay? Unique events are very memorable, and a consequence of that is the next point, is that they're frequently rehearsed, they be said often, over and over and over and over again. And not only in the case of the New Testament, it is not only Peter who's saying this, it's hundreds of people who claim to have seen Jesus rise. It's, it's tough to say that that never happened. It's really tough to say people were converting to Christianity because they claimed to have seen the risen Jesus, okay? So the second argument is this. The Gospels are based on recollective memory of eyewitnesses. Recollective memory and frequent rehearsal increase accuracy of events. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that the reports are authentic and accurate. Now, my third argument is a very short argument. It's based on Paul's testimony. Again, we know that Jesus was crucified around 33 AD, and there was a guy named Saul who used to persecute the church. In fact, people who were becoming Christians at the time would be fearful of Saul because he would imprison them, he would oversee their stoning and their murder for converting to Christianity. And what happened was that about two to three years after the crucifixion, Paul had an experience, okay? Paul was on the way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And he claimed to have seen Jesus appear to him, okay? And that dramatically changed his life. That dramatically changed his life. And what happened was, within three years of that experience, Paul met the disciples. As we can see in Galatians 1, he says that he went and he met with Peter, he met with James, the brother of Jesus, just to make sure, after his experience, he was hearing all these things about Jesus, he heard a lot of things, he's like, okay, well, I'm gonna go double check this. So he goes and meets with Peter and James, who were walking with the Lord at the time, and they say, yeah, you got it right on. That's exactly what happened. They spent 15 days together, and then Paul goes away, and about 11 or 14 years later, Paul comes back to see Peter and James, and this time also John, who was there to see the events of the New Testament take place, that is the ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and they extend to Paul the right hand of fellowship because what, what he has been preaching in the past 15 years almost has been exactly what they saw in the life of Jesus. So that gives us reason to believe that Paul was actually had actually encountered um, Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, I just want to say one thing. This is a very naturalistic explanation. This is a very the evidence that I'm giving is essentially naturalistic, right? It obviously points to something greater. It points to something supernatural. In fact, I also used a lot of uh, starting points. For example, the death of Christ by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate in AD 33. No real scholar would disagree with that. No real New Testament scholar, whether they're agnostics like Bart Ehrman, would deny that Paul had a conversion experience. No liberal or conservative scholar would deny that Galatians was actually written by Paul. So Paul actually wrote Galatians and he says a lot of things. And so what we have here in conclusion is we can say the following. Okay, the New Testament is reliable, as I've shown through the, through the manuscript tradition that we have. The gospel narratives are authentic. They are based on the testimony of people who were alive at the time. And Paul's conversion was in fact authentic. There's reason to believe that Paul's conversion was authentic. All the evidence seems to be pointing to that. And therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that the events of the Gospels are true. So Mike is going to have to show us that the New Testament documents are not reliable, that we do not have reason, that in fact the evidence goes against that. Mike will also have to show us that the evidence goes against the authenticity of the Gospels based 
on the source of eyewitnesses. And he will have to also show us that there's some problem, some contradiction in the conversion of Paul. Now I got three minutes for my argument against naturalism. And this is, this is what I have to say. I, I only have one argument against naturalism. And I got to define naturalism as being, and maybe Mike would agree with me, that naturalism is the worldview that only that which is physical exists or that necessarily emerges out of the physical. And so, and we know, there's another thing, naturalists are evolutionists. I am not saying that evolution is false. Evolution, I believe, can be compatible with a supernatural worldview. God could, like Michael Behe, God could have orchestrated the irresistible complexity of cells. Now, the problem is, evolution and naturalism together are inconsistent and they defeat one another. So evolution is concerned with behavior, with the passing on, uh, passing on of genes. It, it is not concerned with truth. And I want to quote Patricia Churchland, who is a neurophilosopher. I studied her often in my philosophy classes. And she wrote this, a nervous system enables an organism to succeed in the four Fs. That is feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. Those are her words. Truth. Whatever that is, takes the hindmost. Truth and beliefs are not part of the evolutionary process. Evolution is blind to truth. Evolution is blind to beliefs. And so that's Churchland. The second is we have reason to doubt whether our belief-forming faculties are in fact reliable. And I quote Darwin here. This is, a, this is what Darwin said, and this is a fantastic quote. He says, with, the, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Essentially, what he's saying is this. Actually, let me, let me quote the second one. What we believe to be true today may be false later on in the evolutionary line. And who said that? That's Frege. God loved Frege. He is a mathematician and philosopher from the, from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, very well regarded in the analytic tradition of philosophy. And he says this, if our beliefs are nothing but brain inscriptions and our brain evolved, and today we believe that 2 plus 2 is 4, and we can't even imagine being otherwise. But it could be the case that 2 plus 2 was 3 100,000 years ago because our brain evolved and the beliefs are in the brain. And it could be that 100,000 years from now, 2 plus 2 is actually going to be 5. What reason do we have to believe that our belief-forming mechanism, our mind, is, it is reliable at all? How do we know that that my belief-forming mechanism has actually provided me with true beliefs about anything at all, when in fact evolution is only concerned with adaptive behavior. It is always a concern. And I conclude with this. If our brains evolved, what reason do we have to believe that they provided us, they provide us with true beliefs, or mostly true beliefs? Is it naturalism is true a belief in itself? Thank you.